Guys, it is Dr. Seuss Friday. What are we doing, Dr. Seuss Friday? We read a Dr. Seuss book. Stop. You've been scrolling for way too long now. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Croak and Crow podcast. I am Spencer Cardia. I am Bernadette Cum. I am Bernadette Cumberbatch. Is that Benedict Cumberbatch's sister? No, but I get that a lot. And this here is Frank uh, wearing his Save the Save the Turtles shirt. Um, you, you guys can. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, you okay? You guys can't, you guys can't see it, but yesterday he was wearing his Christmas sweater yeah. with a jolly Santa with a plump belly, with a bowl full of jelly belly. And so when you put a regular shirt on top of it, it gives him. Oh, the Santa shirt's under there. It How, where's his arms? It gives him a bit of a. Oh, but it really, he looks like a fi- you know, like a fisherman with maybe a little beer it, belly. It, you know what? It doesn't even like it doesn't. You guys can't see it obviously, and it doesn't it has to look be sideways unnatural no it doesn't i kind of want to do this i didn't notice at all i want to i want to wear what he's wearing right now out and just uh-uh. have people see because it really just blends in it it's does just, and then when he you're used talking to have, he used to have abs i was but. looking like wait this guy is you know he's a martial arts um at least yeah no a, he's he, he is, was a martial arts he stopped hitting the gym for a while he says he's going to start again new year's but who knows what those res- how those resolutions he's go the donuts. i was trying to show my santa how you guys doing? It's a beautiful day in December. It is December 10th? <laughs> 16th. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's December 16th. We are officially one week away from holiday weekend, um, Christmas weekend. And it's good to be alive. We're, um, we're counting down the days of Advent. How many candles are lit at this point? Three? Yeah, three. Sure. Yeah, hope, peace, and prosperity. Hope, peace, and love. Faith. Snap, crackle, and pop. Amen to that, sister. So anyway, yeah, we're just flying. Oh, Advent. Happy Advent. Oh, Advent. You got me an Advent (laughs) gift. What could it be? Oh, look at that. Everybody remembers those. The magnet fishing game. A little magnet fishing game. Fishing rod. Um, I've never been fishing, so this will be the closest I get. Well, he does. Yeah. Oh, so today's all all about fishing, Fishing really. Fishing shirt. Thank you, Preston. Um, I will make you the fisher of men. Yep. So Jesus says. He says it. Oh, you're a fisherman? I'll make you the fisher of men. Huh. How about that? Oh, you're a... You're a... I don't know. I was trying to make another, like, something men. Oh, uh, right. Like, you're Spider a fireman? Man? Spider-Man. <laughs> I'll make you the fire of men. Ooh, that's kind of sound of... That's kind of sound of How about Spider-Man? Oh, you're a Spider-Man? How about I make you the spider of men? Oh, he you're did. you're a strong man? I'll make you the strong... Good man, but anyway, guys, yeah, we're just we're just it's Friday, so you know we're all out of sorts. Um, the weather is beautiful. the 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 Lord is beautiful. the The world is beautiful. Let's talk about AI. Alan Iverson, Alan Former Iverson was Sixers a Sixer, I and mean, he was um a favorite. You still see a lot of jerseys around the city. What do you say? No artificial intelligence. Trust the process. I, you know, it, it's not on our cards, and I know you're probably being like, "Why is he bringing this up?" I'm now? wondering if you are maybe. Uh, if you see a different podcast, you 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 were sleeping and you were getting messages about a satellite. Oh yeah, it was. and you woke up uh, repeating the numbers and letter sequence, and now you just have hijacked. A, a Let's st- talk about AI. AI is the best thing ever. How do you feel about and you let the Sixers? One, um, one thing. Uh, reference so, so, the, so there's this new chat thing that you can just like write it and it'll do things for you. Yeah, I it'll heard. write code and it will write poems. Yeah. But then there's like the art AI. Yeah. Um, that we've seen for a while that you could just talk. You could say, "I want Santa Claus climbing up a ladder that reaches the top of um the t- Tower of Babel." an image that was never created before and it will create it using a million mm. other things. Uh, a lot of people are like, this is the future. A lot of people are getting a little nervous. How, yeah. how do you feel as a Christian? As a Christian? I thought you meant as an artist of which I am. Okay. <laughs> I am a Christian too, but <laughs> you're talking about. <laughs> I am an artist and I can speak on that. <laughs> yeah. Christian? What, uh, not so much. Is this not the art podcast? How do I feel about it as an yeah, artist? And a Christian. And a Christian? I just, I don't feel offended as a Christian, so that's the confusion for me. But I do feel offended as a as a um, a writer, 
Yeah. And as an artist, and I know that is silly because I knew, I knew a few years ago, quite a few years ago, um, when my kids were still in school and they had to write essays on something that had been written on a million times. Yeah. Uh, even for that teacher, you know, she could, she could do the, she could be half asleep and do that class because it's, a, you know, it's the same thing every single time. And then just replicate that in all the schools in the city, in the state, in the country, in the world, year after year. And then they'll say, tell us about, um, I don't know what, the Battle of the Potomac River or something. In your own words. Yeah. Okay. How is it going to be possible eventually? So I thought that all that time ago. I thought, okay, we are all researching from the internet. And yeah, yeah we're putting in our with own a, With a, a, a person who's been, a, a, was alive and died and... There's only so much. It's not like, yeah. oh, well, this is a new study. No. done. Yeah. And so they would say, watch out. We're going to run it through the plagiarism check tr- checker. And then we're going to uh, really like arrest you, yeah. put you in plagiarism jail. It was very, yeah. very. The, the plagiarism, <laughs> plagiarism death penalty. Yeah. Uh, it's still illegal in Pennsylvania. And um, you'll be shunned from your from your people. Yeah. Excommunication <laughs> from the church. Yes. Yeah. And and I thought, uh, how are, how is, how would even even unintentionally, you know, sometimes people do that with music. They'll unintentionally write the same tune and then they get sued. And then they're like, I thought of the tune because we're getting our ideas. Yeah. So I already thought that there was a problem with the amount of information that the same people were putting on the Internet and that it can be replicated. And I wondered what would happen. Now, AI is just able to have all of the information immediately available to it. at least we have to like look it up or have experience with it. They can just look it straight up and figure it out. And you know what I mean? Not even figure it out, pull what's already there. Yeah. But they do learn, right? Yeah. Yeah. Learn behaviors. And so I feel that it's inevitable. I don't feel, I feel that it is highly unusual and, but I'm, I'm not against it. I mean, (laughs) as a Christian, I, I feel that it doesn't take away from my soul. Yeah. But it's just kind of scary, you know, thinking that like, there's a technology that's just thinking for itself and doing that. All right. Well, I, I'm not against it either as a Christian. I'm kind of against it as an artist, you know, like uh, yeah. there is that idea of like, I, I, and you see it do poems and stuff. Um, and I just had this thought. I'm like, what happens when someone's favorite poem wasn't created by a person at all? Right. And I was getting this kind of worry of like, are we losing our individuality and yeah. our, our, like, it's always been the science man, and the creative person who I would even put into a spiritual branch um, were separate. And this is kind of like, I don't know, science wants creativity too. And yeah. <clears throat> that's what I thought at first. And then as a Christian, I was thinking about it. Like, you know, it kind of gave me a fear of that. Like person, our person, you know, I know every hair in your head. And it's like, it just feels like you. it takes away some of our human personalities and creativity. And then I thought of a bigger thought that made it kind of you know, scary if you think about it too much, but not scary of like this idea of collective conscience mm-hmm. and how we're all part of the like world. Can you always say we're all, we're all connected to each other, Jesus right. and all of us and stuff. And um, nobody knows what heaven's like and stuff. But the th- th- thing I like that is a comforting thought about these AI things is it's not coming up with new things it's using all of our creativity to create something it's this idea of we are all creative people and together you can you have and so you know you oh like when you, when you die you like you learn all the answers and stuff and it's this idea of like we're a lot more connected than right. you think right and when these computers are putting making this sort of like synthetic um interconnectivity between all of us you get this these wonders and it's like yeah of course like you, of course there's more creativity when you put us all together personally earthly it's like hey you ruined an art for us but in a way it's like no it took all of us to make that piece. of course ai did you couldn't make it in a vacuum and have it work right it needed all of the creativity of all of the people all it, of it all needed of, all of, us to tell them where the um traffic light was you know every time you have the the blocks tell me you're not a robot 
You no, know that was it, teaching AI. Yeah. Oh, uh, was it? Yeah. It, it took um, all of the IT guys to have it write code. Like mm-hmm. it's kind of just a testament mm-hmm. to all of our own strengths. Yes. And now just putting it all together in the most kind of like socialistic way, which is, you know, can be not fun earthly, but in the spirit, I mean, I'd imagine heaven is, is a bit of socialism, right? Like it's it's the idea that you're all on a level of playing field. You're all sharing love and nothing is being held from anyone else. Right. And so on, like, and just kind of like a, a little bit, you see that. You see like the beauty in collective conscience. Yes. We will, we will grow from even this. So it's actually going to give us a big old trampoline forward into creativity where we can't see that right now because we think what, but let's take um, food for instance. And, and uh, you know, we used to grind flour. We did. And you would take you all, <laughs> it take all day for you to get the wheat and turn it into flour. And then you can make wheat cakes or something yeah. like this. And then, you know, it got, it got, everything got improved and, 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 industrialized and mechanized and so now like you don't have to spend so much time making flour but think of all the the bakery products you know that you can make now that this has been taken care of for you um and the same thing yes you can buy a store-bought cake but people still want to make the regular cakes but i feel that even though right now we think how could we build on it how we will find a way to do that plus just to say collective consciousness of what you just talked about uh, I uh, was on a poetry platform on the internet. It's worldwide and it has like, I don't know, half a million users or something. And that's just users. Each one of these, not each one, but most people are writing hundreds of poems. Okay. Okay. And when you write your poem and like you said, it's individual. And what if the person didn't write it? You do not realize that you are writing a poem that someone else wrote. In another place, it could be next door, but even in another time. And so they have this thing, it's called auto rank. Yeah. As you're typing your poem, as you're creating it out of your mind. And d- when you write certain words, if you want to, if you want to um, describe the moon as a, a glowing white disc or start, it's like, it'll give you Big like. ball of cheese. Yeah. Anything. It, the auto rank, will. it doesn't tell you not to, but it says weak words. And, and the weak words pop up. It's because their computers. Brrr, so I would never know that it, what my my poem wasn't that original. But this computer, yeah. who everyone's writing on the platform, can see that it's not original. People get mad at the auto rank. The 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 uh, the, the the company is like turn it. You can turn it off. <laughs> but I don't like to turn it off. Because I don't want to be so predictable or so, you know mm. what I mean? And and then you think, well, how else will I describe a sunset? And it's like, think of one. Yeah. So we already, because we have these experiences and even more shared experiences now because the internet. Yeah. Um, we were becoming less original. Yeah. Whether we liked it or not. So I think we can build off of it. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, we actually we had a walk through Thursday a few weeks ago. It was talking about um, some of the the important people in the old testament and was saying through all of them it's perfect and then we were going on to say how david wasn't perfect on his own right um samson wasn't perfect those are some of the names that i think was samuel or no I can't, it was one of those books oh, yeah or was, was describing when he was saying like through all this uh, like it made like the bible perfect in a way or it made right this and it's also sort of the same with us you know with these new technology like i said it doesn't dehumanize the art mm. it takes from everyone and in a way it makes it per it, like the you have to stop looking at ai as a um i mean you don't have to stop i could be saying this and then famous last words they kill the segue us, they kill us all <laughs> but i'm saying from what i'm seeing and my fear of seeing like poems created is you have to stop thinking of it like a robot is saying i can write a poem better than you and think of like one person can write a poem and like not be all or it could have been a forgotten poem in the depths of the internet but with like everything's being pulled from everyone's poem is being pulled from and in a way it like that is the beauty of it it's it becomes its own thing through everyone right and even all for one and one for all and it can predict what we like um what we want to see in here just like you know people get mad that you get targeted ads but it's like it is targeted because it's 
otherwise you'd be at a loss yeah. of what of what I want to do. And I mean, I don't see anyone doing cave drawings, you know. So it's not like it's not like uh, art hasn't changed all throughout time. And when paper was invented or or paintbrushes, people weren't like. I'm not giving up my chisel. You know, some yeah. people did, but you know what I'm saying? All right. And that's all. I mean, that's always the thing. Like, you know, there's when, uh, when, um, photography came out that ruined, did that ruin painting? Why do I need to draw a landscape if, if it's just, exactly. you can just photograph a exactly. landscape? It's like, or portraits. Yeah. You, know, you can, or the internet. Like, yeah. well, you saw it with like social media and, and shopping, socializing. Shopping. We're constantly in this in this hamster wheel. Blah blah. It's, blah blah. It's Dr. Seuss Friday. Try to try to AI this. This is organic. You can't because you can't. guess why? He makes words up, which I'm thinking Ooh. might be the way around it. Dr. Seuss knew what was coming. AI is after us all, but not after Dr. Seuss. Guys, it is Dr. Seuss Friday. What do we do on Dr. Seuss Friday? We read a Dr. Seuss book. Stop. You've been scrolling for way too long now. <laughs> Uh, um, it might seem like we're reading kids' books. We're not. All right. Dr. Seuss was an awesome guy. This was, this in particular was actually written for old people, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> A book for obsolete children. Isn't that funny? Oh, obsolete children. Like, it's, yeah. They're old. You're old. Yeah. Which is funny because actually that entire line is funny because this is a book for old people. But we always talk about reading kids' book with adult brains. Yeah. But the way he describes is like, uh, it's like these words are meant for everyone. Right. So as a kid, you read Dr. Seuss and you get these crazy characters and these very cra uh, clever rhymes. And what's nice about Dr. Seuss and what differentiates him from other child book authors is the meaning, like the the moral messages that are being passed through these books. And I think maybe you think, too, that it's why they stand the test of time more yeah. than just the characters. So we've done like 40 of these and we read with our adult brains and we try to see past, see between the lines of what is what is Dr. Seuss getting to children. And when I say children, it's not just kids. Children of To a childlike brain, which is what? Perce perceptible to information. Open-minded. Yeah. Open-minded. Open-minded. So, uh, and we'll, like we always say, it's like Sudoku for the brain. You know, your brain, brain puzzles. Isn't all Sudoku for the brain? Like brain puzzles, you know, to keep your brain strong. I th we do think this helps when you're doing your Bible reading and um, you're reading a parable and you want to find out what the meaning of that is. Jesus talks in parables. This is like a fun little way of, of dissecting something a little bit easier and finding a message yeah. that mm -hmm. can carry on to other things. So we are reading You're Only Old Once. You're Only Old Once by Dr. Seuss. Which, of course, you only ever hear You're Only Young Once. Yeah. And you're so, Only Old Once, huh? Yeah. I feel like I'm going to like this one. <laughs> Like all, of them. all right, guys, let's just read it. Have you any idea how much money these tests are costing you? I think he made this when he was like 80. If laughter is the best medicine, then you're only old once is a delightful new defense against aging. Anyone's ever been submitted? Bob, do you Bob. hear me? I think he wrote this in his 80s. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. One day you will read in the National Geographic of a faraway land with no smelly bad traffic. In those green pastured mountains of Fada Fazi. Everybody feels fine at 103 because the air that they breathe is potassium free and because they chew nuts from a tut -a tut tree. This gives strength to their teeth, it gives length to their hair, and they live without doctors, without nary a care. And you'll find yourself wishing that you were out there in Fada Fazi and not here in this chair, in the Golden Years Clinic on Century Square for spleen readjustment and muffler repair. Just why are you here? You're not feeling your best. You've come in for an eyesight insolvency test. And if you're the type that gets finicky for Nick, at this point you'll try to get out of that clinic. But they will outwit you as quick as a winnick. The quiz docs will catch you. They'll start questionnaireing. They'll ask you point blank how your parts are all faring. And your grandfather parts, and please try to recall, if your grandmother hurt in the spring or the fall. Did your cousins have dreadful wild nightmares at night? Do they suffer such ailments as buzz driver's blight, chimney sweep stupor, or prune picker's plight, and describe the main cause of your uncle's collapse, too much al alphabet soup or martinis, perhaps? And the next thing you know when you finish that test is somehow you've lost both your necktie and vest, and an ogler is ogling, an ogler is ogling your stomach and chest. 
Your escape plans have melted. You haven't a chance. For the next thing you know, both your socks and your pants and your drawers and your shoes have been lost for the day. The oglers have blossomed like roses in May. And silently, grimmingly, the I ogle away. I think it's ogle, isn't it? No, you're ogling it. Goggle, goggle. I think it's ogle. But it doesn't... What those oglers have learned, they are not ready to tell. Clinic, cl- clinicians don't spout their opinion pell-mell. So you're back with the vestibule, fish for a spell. Norval won't bring you much comfort, you know, but he's quite sympathetic as clinic fish go. There you'll sit several hours, grow intenser each second. Fear in your fate will be worse than you reckoned, till finally Miss Becker, your beckoner, beckons. To a booth where the world-renowned your man Von Crandall has perfected a test known as bellows and candle. If the wind from the bellows can't blow out the flame, You failed, and you're going to be sorry you came. You'll be told that your hearing so murky and muddy, your case calls for special intensified study. They'll test you with noises from far and from near, and you'll get a black mark from the ones you can't hear. Then they'll say, my dear fellow, you're deafer than most, but there's a hope since you're not quite as deaf as a post. We'll study your symptoms, we'll give you a call, in the meantime go back and sit down in the hall. So you'll find yourself talking to Norval once more, and Norval will think you're a bit of a bore, because Norval had heard these same stories before. To this fish you'll become a plain pain in the neck, while you wait once again for Miss Becker to beck. But Miss Becker won't come, with a great swish and great swank, a wheelchair will come, you've gained status and rank. And Weldon the wheeler will say with great pride, you've qualified sir, you are now certified, as a VIP case you're entitled to ride. Through thin and through thick, I'll be at your backside. Dear Weldon will show you the great sights as you go. Right now you are riding down stethoscope row, and I know that like all our top patients you're hoping to get yourself stethed with some fine first-class scoping. So I'm sure you'll be simply delighted to hear that the internal organs Olympics last year, Dr. Schmidt, Schmoot, Sinatra, Sylvester, and Fonz won 15 gold medals, 9 silver, 6 bronze. For the moment, however, we'll pass by this bunch. There's plenty of time to see them after lunch. You'll see Dr. Pollen, our allergy whiz, who knows every sniffle and itch that there is. Dr. Pollen will find, as he works on your case, if the face powder is wrong on your stepsister's face. He will check your reactions to thumbtacks and glue, catcher's mitts, leaf mold, and cardigans, too. Nasturtiums and marble cake, white and blue chalks, and thracite coal and the feather of hawks also corn on the cob also buffalo grease and how you'll react when you started you're stared at by geese he'll take copious notes then i'll hazard a guess that i'll send you downstairs to see dr van ness van ness has enjoyed a high rate of success in his pioneer work in the study of stress so you can be sure he will stress you a trifle then he'll send you around to see dr van eiffel Dietitian Von Eiffel controls the whiffer, our diet devised and computerized sniffer, on which you will simply lie down in repose and sniff a great food as it goes past your nose, from caviar souffle to caribou roast, from pemmican patties to terrapin toast. He'll find out by sniff scan the foods you like most. And when the guy finds what you like, you can bet it won't be on your diet. From here on, forget it. I think I did that wrong, wrong. (laughs) <laughs> that into the new wing we'll see Dr. Spet Reckles, who does the three F's, footsies, fungus, and freckles. And nextly we'll drop you on young Dr. Gins, our A and S man who does antrums and shins. And of course he'll refer us to Drs. McGrew, McGuire, McPherson, and Blinn and Ballou. And Timkins and Tompkins and Diller and Drew, Fitzsimmons, Fitzgerald, and Fitzpatrick too. Two of all whom you will, will prescribe a prescription for you. From your pill drill, you'll go to room 663, where a voice will instruct you, repeat after me, this small white pill is what I munch at breakfast and right after lunch. I take a pill that's Kelly Green before each meal and in between. These Loganberry colored pills I take every morning chills. I take a pill with zebra stripes to cure my early evening gripes. These orange tinted ones, of course, I take to cure my Charlie horse. I take three blues at half past eight to slow my exhalation rate. Are on alternate nights at 9 p.m. I swallow pinkies, four of them. The reds which my eyebrows, the red, the reds which make my eyebrows strong. I eat like popcorn all day long. 
The speckled browns then were what I keep beside my bed to help me sleep. This long flat one is what I take if I should die before I wake. <laughs> when at last we are sure you've been properly pilled, then a few paper forms must be properly filled so that you and your heirs may be properly billed. Whereupon, if you're smart, there's a very great chance that you'll meet soon again with your socks, coat, and pants. And you'll know once your necktie's back under your chin, and Norval has waved you Godspeed with his fin, you're in pretty good shape for the shape that you're in. The end. I like it. You like it? Yeah, I do like it. I like it. Um, I like that he was still writing in his 80s. I like the fish because the fish is from, it, the fish is from Cat in the Hat, isn't it? It is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Norval. Um, and I just like that. Look, we just talked about AI and branching out. And, and this was obviously citing real things that older people go through, right? You know, like the testing, the questions, the, the, the pills, the, the billing, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I thought it was okay. I mean, what's, what's, what's up with you? No, I like it. Oh, okay. Uh, I like it a lot. Once again, I like um, a book for obsolete children. Um, it kind of like, because especially, so Dr. Seuss is right in this. Yeah. It's fine. At an old age where like, um, and it's kind of goes to show that everyone will say like, and I always say, it's like we have like, you know, uh, we're, we're all children at heart in a way. Right, right. And so it's, showing that like nothing changes about like the wonder and and the jokingness the reason we read dr seuss books right also it starts off with this like talking about like the place of follow the zoo and i kind of see it as like maybe heaven in a way oh was, where, I, a few times i was getting heaven vibes where it was like there is a place like that right like where everyone's living they're feeling fine they're feeling great they're dancing around and then it brings it back to earth but not in a way to say but for now things are, like, and so he was getting thrown around and you know going to every doctor imaginable of uh, the same old story every single old person why i liked it is because even like i think on the front cover of the book it was saying like to have a little laugh like you give this to an old person and kind of like you're not in heaven you're not in the land of follow the zoo so it's like finding the humor in Exactly. It, it's like I agree with the way it's bouncing around. Like being at a hospital can be like it, it can get so anxiety. Like, okay, I'm on the next doctor. Like, yeah. How many doctors have I seen? Right. But it's like it makes it a like a joke almost, and that's why I, I kind of like how even Doctor Seuss made this because I don't know if it's um I don't know if it's a depressing thought or a beautiful thought to like think of it like. There is still this like the childlike aspect of it. Why would you it, think it's depressing though? I think there's only that it's yeah. Well, and so it's it's not it's sort of like just a uh, thing. It would be like oh, you mean if someone said like you've never grown up or something? No, not at all. Oh. I, I'm just saying like it's it. Yeah, you know, you're only old once. It, old people die, and yeah, you're yeah, at yeah. the hospital. You have a lot right. of ailments and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like to change a perspective of that person and like see it as a life is silly and like yeah. this is all silly it's like the same way all the doctors Se- basically every dr seuss book is characterized as a kid like yeah in antics like right. um, or even in bad situations like what was that one of like i'm not afraid of the dark yeah and it's like sort of like going around like where am right. i and so it's sort of like all of these illustrations was of an old man being carted around right but it's like you could sort of in your head change it to that same kid yeah you're right from these past books of like oh i'm being pushed around like or like the kid with like too many hats and he's getting like and so it kind of just like pulls that child like aspect out of all of us just into another wacky situation with all these people and and i think it's very nice in that way i think it says a lot about dr seuss who we we already we don't even need to be more of a fan of this person, but yeah. because when you think of an author or anybody, you think of an artist or baker or a cabinet maker, they do it for, we were sit, the, the book we read last time was, what do you want to be? You know, cause I, and I said, well, you have to make money. You have to be an adult. And so his job was writing and, and drawing, uh, illustrating. Yeah. And so like, yeah, this was my job. And I wrote kids books. We even said that he literally said, my name is Dr. Seuss in the beginning. Cause it was like, 
Is that like yeah. what kind of author is makes this? And so this is my job at work. I write children's books and then my editor, you know, I sell them to my editor. But for, for him to be doing it at 80 and for it to re- be reflective of what he was going through and what people go through, yeah. I found it to be, it wasn't just your job. It wasn't. Yes. yes. It was your, when he is at the doctor's office without even writing, um, you know, it's like seeing this, they talked about this, the, the scope that keeps stething, stethoscope, yeah. you know, just to like, just see everyday life, even sickness or old age Yeah. in a fantastical way. Yeah, no, definitely. And like, I think one, um, it's, it's like, so we, yeah, so we, it kind of goes to why we're rereading them. It's for one, I think in Dr. Seuss's own life, it was a form of therapy, right? Yeah. Like where you, you, you re- keep reminding yourself how silly life is, yeah. right? Like, and all of the, like, all of the morals aren't really based on like you need to do this morally, right. right? It's almost like how silly is it to do wrong? Right. We had the book with like, the, these creatures that one had stars and the others didn't. Right, right. And they were bickering and the stars were going back and right. forth. So it wasn't so much of like, don't discriminate. It yeah. was like, how silly that we are discriminating. Yeah. And how silly is life. And so I think Dr. Seuss used that to like, because like he might have very well been an- anxious and like, right. I feel like, I'm, and it's like, take a step back. And and so I think there, there, that's why we, we read it as adults. It's all of, the, all of these things are not Dr. Seuss was was a a you know superhuman person who was able to have all these ideas all of us it's it's a constant reminder yeah. it's like nobody is, is going through life being like life is so silly right it's like you are going to get anxious and right the the so like yeah you if i if i start going to the hospital you know knock on wood and i'm going all through this it wouldn't be like Oh, like, don't worry. Life is silly. It's yeah. like, I would get this book and it pulls me out of it. It's right. Like, what am I doing? Right. You ever get so mad and then you, you look at yourself yeah. and like you, uh, a, a kid runs past you and you throw your food up and it lands on your head. And it's like, that's like the tip of the iceberg. And then you're just like, look how silly this is. Yeah. And you laugh. It's like, it's sort of, you always have to constantly remind yourself. Yeah how silly things are yeah and, and you know remember um uh, he didn't have children yeah dr seuss and his wife and i think uh, i think she wanted them or it just didn't happen for them but it's in it's I, I, they're they're dead and gone now but like for the a lot of people even like elf on the shelf i think the lady wrote the book for her child you always see this kind of like um why did these people write these books yeah. oh but I, I started telling my kid uh, nursery rhymes and someone told me i could sell it like he literally wrote these for the world absolutely of all ages yeah Hundred percent, and you know this especially, like you said, it, it kind of goes to who he was. And I find more times than not that is the case. I, I think obviously, you know, maybe you have like a celeb, don't meet your celebrity. But I'm talking about these people that you see as you know the Mister Rogers yeah. and, and the you know, Doctor Seuss and stuff. It's in the long run, you always sort of find out. It's like they practiced what they preached, yeah. and it's like it wasn't Doctor Seuss knew how to write to children. It's Dr. Seuss learned how to write to the child within him. Yes. And that's why it was received differently than uh, a team of executives saying, next children's book, what, right. what are we doing? Right. I, want, I want a tomato with a face. Let's call it Veggie Tales. <laughs> but that's Dr. Seuss Friday, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, come back next week. It'll be like the Christmas week. That whole thing. <laughs> Peace. Peace.